This week, RGFS hit the road to San Francisco. Dolby sponsored this video and our trip to their new headquarters to give a glimpse into how their technologies have affected films past and present and what innovations they have planned for the future. We thought this was really cool because Dolby is a name we're all familiar with, but a lot of us, me included, don't know what they actually do. So we have a big day ahead of us. This man is named Glenn. I'm Glenn Kaiser, I'm the director of the Dolby Institute, and the Dolby Institute is uh, kind of a new program for, for Dolby. It's our education outreach initiative. And I've got the really cool job of basically reaching out to emerging content creators with education and inspiration about how to use image and sound more creatively for storytelling. That's great. So uh, what are some things we're going to be seeing today? So you are going to go from all over the Dolby building. You're going to hear uh, a little bit about our history and how we got started in the cinema business and then in the broadcast business. And then you're going to hear a lot about what we're, you know, what we're moving into today. You know, we've got a great reputation for doing fantastic work with audio, but we're really excited too about what we're doing with image now. Well, shall we get started? Let's do it. Awesome. First, here's a brief history of Dolby. Dolby was founded in 1965 by its founder, Ray Dolby, and coming out of his PhD at Cambridge, he solved one of the biggest problems in recording sound, which was that when you recorded sound, you got a ton of hiss, and he got rid of the hiss. In the industry, that's called noise reduction. From there, the company expanded into film. Going back to the first use of Dolby noise reduction in Stanley Kubrick's The Clockwork Orange. And I felt all the malanky little hairs on my plot standing endwise. The use of Dolby stereo in Star Wars. In 1992, Batman Returns used Dolby Digital for the first time. Meow. And then more recently, Dolby Atmos was used in Pixar's Brave. So this is Adobe Atmos mixing space. This is sort of like a big home theater sized version and it features 7.1 channels and four overhead channels. What does Atmos present? What's the, uh, what makes it unique in terms of immersion or storytelling? The way that it works is it's a hardware software combination. Through Pro Tools, you have specialized panners that give you a very high resolution pan around the room and gives you the ability to put things over the audience as well. When you're in a cinema, you know, you've got a lot of different surround channels, especially a big cinema. You may have 20 surrounds on the side. I'll tell you the satisfaction of having the ability to put stuff over people's head. So what we're looking at on screen here is the way that you actually can pan an, an object. And the idea is that you can grab onto the ball and move it around. That's in the regular XY space. And then there's a Z space as well that is going up into the ceiling. Because each speaker is individually amplified, you can pan through each, each speaker. And having that fine control, you can get so high resolution in your panning and your detail so that everything becomes much more lifelike. Where is it going in the future? Are there any kind of like upcoming you know, platforms you'd like to get Atmos stuff on? Or? So believe it or not, and this is kind of the Dolby way, we start usually with uh, some innovation in the theater and then eventually it trickles down into the cell phone in your pocket. Right. So that's already happened. There are already cell phones from Lenovo, for instance, that, uh, that have an Atmos uh, headphone virtualizer built in. Believe it or not, Atmos is in like the Kindle Fire mm. HD. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's coming out of left backs around. The same way an Atmos mix is scalable to a home theater, it can translate all the way down to headphones. In VR, Atmos can convincingly place sounds around you, allowing audio cues to drive the experience. Virtual reality is important to Dolby because we are excited to build the technologies that greatest content creators use in order to facilitate these meaningful connections. 
to me, these people tend to disappear as soon as they put the things on, because I realize they're not here, they're somewhere else. It can really give you an edge in gaming, too, allowing you to pinpoint exactly where that enemy gunfire is coming from. Star Wars Battlefront supports Atmos at home. And Overwatch supports it even on headphones. Great, that's lunch. So how does Dolby develop new technologies like Atmos? The answer is science. I'm Poppy Crum. I'm head scientist at Dolby Laboratories. We spend a lot of time thinking about how we experience the world, how our senses take in the information around us, and then how can we, one, take that and turn that into uh, algorithms that can ultimately lead to new technologies. How can we better understand the impact of our technologies? emotional impact, building technologies that are more engaged, how you experience them and how you interact with the world. So I, I'm just giving you an idea of some of the things in this room. You've got thermal imaging cameras. We have multiple ways of also studying the diameter of your pupil or where you happen to be looking to. Um, you can actually use things like the diameter of your pupil to tell how aroused you are, or in some cases, how much your brain is working, the cognitive load. Some of the things we've been looking at are visual engagement under high dynamic range viewing. And when you're watching content that has a wider color gamut, higher luminance levels, you know, it's brighter, it's more impactful. These are you know, parts of Dolby Vision and being able to show that people are more attentive, they're more engaged. You, know, you can't know when you're more excited, you can't say you're more aroused or I'm more engaged in these different things because paying attention mm -hmm. to trying to say whether you are, that, that breaks the whole experience right. to start with. And so the whole thing is we want to be able to let people be more natural, more engaged and, and do what they do. And, you know, also be able to capture changes in what you know, creates better experiences and then build those better experiences with that kind of information coming in. We've seen how Dolby integrates its technologies for audiences. Now let's see how they're doing it for creators too. And so we've got a great partnership with Adobe um, where we've done a lot of work to implement the ability to create distribute and export mixes in the Dolby Digital Plus sort of surround sound format and have that process be deeply integrated into Premiere. Just a much broader array of really great creative people can take advantage of all the stuff that we build in these crazy labs. To me, that's really cool because, you know, like I feel like growing up, you know, Dolby's like a brand name you see a lot, but you don't touch directly, right. you know, and when you start cutting stuff or when, when I did, it was like, you know, maybe one day we'll get you know, this, this process done to it or whatever. But now yeah. it's, just, it's, it's so cool that that's becoming more readily available. Yeah, and you know, and our job is to make sure that stuff that's available in the cinema, and we've been really good at showing how we can take that and move that all the way down into the device in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And so now the path for us is to do the same for high dynamic range video and the same for over time VR. I hope you're as excited as we are about these recent and upcoming technologies that we'll be able to use in new and exciting ways to tell stories. Oh look, here's Glenn again. Oh hey. Oh, hey, yeah, thanks again for having us by. Well, it was our pleasure to have Rocket Jump Film School at Dolby today. Are the links appearing yet? <laughs>